All right. Good evening, everyone. This is Lori Charlton. It's March 9th, 2023. I want to welcome everyone to the Board of Finance budget hearing uh, for the fiscal 23-24 budget. I'll call the meeting to order and ask that we please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, to the members of the public, this is our second budget hearing out of a total of eight that are scheduled, and we'll continue through the month until we vote on the budget to be recommended to the RTM on March 30th. As always, residents are encouraged to send comments and questions before or after the meetings to the following email, bof at fairfieldct.org. If you do so, please remember to include your name and address in your email as you would with live public testimony. Uh, in addition, we'll provide an opportunity for live public comment during tonight's hearing that's pertinent to the budget for Fairfield Public Schools. For residents who are joining us through WebEx, please know that you're muted and will not be heard by board members until public comment is called for. Uh, we ask that anyone uh, making a statement limit their comments to two minutes. Uh, for anyone who wants to provide uh, live public comment on the school budget and doesn't have an opportunity to do so tonight, we'll also hold a public hearing on Saturday morning, March 25th at Fairfield Ludlow High School. That's an opportunity for residents to have their voices heard on any aspect of the budget or the budget as a whole. So with that, we will move uh, right into item three, uh, discussion uh, of the uh, Board of Education budget. And I wanna thank uh, you all for being here. I'm gonna initially turn it over to uh, the chair of the Board of Education, Jen Jacobson, to kick us off. Welcome. Hi, welcome everyone. And uh, so glad to be with you all here this evening on behalf of the Board of Education. Uh, we're excited to share with you a proposal for our 2023-2024 operating budget. With me here this evening is our superintendent, Mr. Testani the Board of Finance Liaison, Board of Education member, Mr. Peterson, our Chief Financial Officer, Ms. Laborious, and our Director of Special Education and People Services, Mr. Mancusi, as well as several board members in the audience. And we look forward to our discussion tonight. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our superintendent for his presentation. Thank you. Thank you, good evening. Um, happy to be here tonight for my first um, budget presentation for this body. Um, before I get started, I'm just gonna walk you through a brief presentation. I'm not gonna bore you by reading every line item um, word for word for you, but I do wanna highlight some of the things that um, this budget proposes, some the theory and the structure around building this budget, and also highlight the why. Not sure if you can see that, but this but <laughs> obviously <laughs> this budget is um, focused on improving academics, professional learning and growth, social emotional learning and equity, student support, and building a strong sense of community through communication. Some of the main focus areas of the budget was to obviously to maintain the excellence here in the Fairfield Public Schools, respect relationships with fami families, faculty, and community, while managing costs, reallocating funds to limit increases, sustain our class size goals, and support strong programming. Framework of this budget is structurally balanced, strategic, trying to receive a high return on our, on our investment here in the district, and also to limit climbing costs and increases. As I said, the why. Why do we invest in public education here in Fairfield? First of all, we are an A-plus overall grade, niche grade rating. We have 202 students who earned the seal of biliteracy last year. As a result of the state 2020 Smarter Balance Assessment, we
We have five schools of distinction, six national merit semifinalists. Three of our elementary schools were recognized for top 10 in the state for English language arts performance. One elementary school was ranked number one in the state for growth in our high need subgroup. Our high school earned the highest math proficiency in this math SAT indicator, indicator excuse me, in our DERG. We had 108 AP scholars. 85% of our AP test takers earned a score of three or better. Fairfield Public Schools was voted the best community for music education. 15 Fairfield Public School art students were named Scholastic Art Award winners. 86 students were selected for the Connecticut Music Educators Association Western Regional Festival. 19, 19 of our Connecticut Regional Scholastic Art winners from Fairfield Public Schools. Artwork created by our high school students was selected for the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth Emerging Young Artist Juried Competition. Our Tomlinson art teacher won a Paley grant to create a mosaic mural. Roger Ludlow Middle School teacher and Fairfield art students are highlighted in an article in Time for Kids. Community outreach. Memory Project artists created portraits for youth around the world who have experienced extreme neglect and poverty. The recycled animal sculpture exhibit are life-size animal sculptures created by a Roger, a Fairfield Ludlow High School art students that are exhibited at the Fairfield Library downtown branch. 102 holiday cards were created for the residents of the Carlton by the Art Honor Society students. Collab collaborative pumpkin painting with fifth grade at Osborne Hill facilitated by our National Art Honor Society students. 207 students were selected for the Western Regional Festival to participate in a performance with the Boston Children's Chorus. Clinic and performance with the Canadian Brass, a renowned performing arts ensemble. And obviously, the annual Townwide Music Festival unites musicians from every school in the district to perform in a combined concert, developing community spirit across the town. If you've ever been to any of our four sold out annual holiday concerts at our high schools, you can see how it brings the community together. There's also matinee performances of these holiday concerts for members of our local senior centers and annual performances at the town of Fairfield's Tree Light. Our Veterans Day concerts honor our vets, our town's music Holocaust Memorial event, and the annual Memorial Day Parade. Also, one in six of our music faculty are Fairfield Public School alumni. They come back. And then we also have produced Kelly O'Hara, Tony Award winning Broadway star, and of course, the great John Mayer, Grammy Award winning musician. Excuse me. What else do we have? 50 plus honors and advanced placement course offerings. Our 2022 graduates were accepted to over 150 colleges and universities. Ward and Ludlow students participate in 40 varsity athletic teams and 30 sub varsity athletic teams. Over 92% of students participate in post-secondary education. Many of our students experience early college, ex excuse me, early college experiences at UConn and Sacred Heart. And our high school students engage in a variety of art, drama, and music programs. Again, why do we invest? This is why we invest. 43 of our student athletes signed on college signing day. We had 19 FCAC champions. and four uh, division championships. What does this all equate to? An ask this share of 4.05% for the proposed budget increase. 
what does that in entail? Some of the ways that we, examples of budget efficiencies in this year's budget. We have tuition and fees, our non-residents tu tuition program, athletic gates, Chromebook insurance, generate approximately $350,000 in revenue. Through our Early Literacy Academy at McKinley School, there's a cost avoidance for in-house services for elementary students with dyslex dyslexia and significant language-based disabilities, which is a net of about $550,000 in savings. This year, we're um, being more um, thoughtful in our Chromebook rollout and repurchase with our current year surplus. And again, we're looking to reinvest and engage in software um, for printing and energy management, while also utilizing consortium, consortium pricing for our edu educational materials. The majority of the increase in this year's ask is due to contractual obligations and insurance costs. That estimates to about 3.86 percent of the overall 4.05 percent ask in this year's budget. This also incorporates paraeducator compensation. If you're not aware, many of our, our paraeducators for many years have been severely underpaid. Uh, we have uh, struck an agreement with their bargaining unit to raise the, um, the pays to be more competitive for retention purposes. These are very critical staff members um, that work closely with our students, especially our students with high needs. Full-time contracts uh, account for a little over $2.8 million, or 1.4% of the increase. We had to add mandated staffing for English language learners uh, of about a half a million dollars, which is almost a quarter of a percent of the increase. Increasing student support to support mental health needs is a little over $300,000 or 0.17%, and again, the paraeducator compensation adjustment um, is almost a 1% increase. Uh, our insurance benefits um, through the estimated uh, report from the state and the Connecticut Partnership Plan accounts for about 1.18 increase toward this budget. About a quarter percent of it is related to increases to utilities, critical IT, facility infrastructure, and obviously the increased, as we all know, cost of transporting our students to and from school due to raising fuel costs. Uh, that breaks down, most of it is, uh, again, the IT maintenance uh, is a little over $86,000, utilities and facilities, uh, 365,000 approximately in transportation, a little over 57,000 for a total of half, slightly over half a million dollars of the increase. So there's really not a lot of ask in this budget that we could avoid. We did do that through some reductions. Uh, through instruction, services, and fees, we reduced almost $800,000 in savings. We were able, through some contracted services, going out to bid and looking at other contracted service providers, save about $100,000. We saved almost a quarter of a million dollars on capital equipment and purchased services for about a reduction of a little, almost slightly below $1.2 million. Again, we have some increases in books, supplies, and materials that would be natural for a district this size. Um, actually, the number's pretty low when you think about 9,300 students. That increase is slightly above $185,000. We do have out-of-district tuition, which makes up a little over 622,000 of the increase uh, here, and then staffing enhancements, um, additional athletic coaches, uh, community liaison, and our early literacy academy that we're trying to expand. But as I mentioned earlier, there's offsets to uh, cost avoidance in the future um, by providing early intervention to these students that have uh, severe needs. We have several areas, as you can see, that where there was budget lines with reductions, tech systems and equipment, uh, tech capital, district technology supply, supplies and materials. You can see uh, per, uh, professional consultation for special education has declined over $200,000.
and 397,000 on nursing services. So they're again, looking to be fiscally responsible, not just asking for more in the budget, but also looking for areas where we can be more effective and more efficient. There were some questions and there's been some questions around enrollment and we've seen a slight decline in enrollment over the last several years and why doesn't that equate to uh, a decline in our budget? Um, with the slight enrollment spread across 17 buildings and 13 grade levels, it's not significant enough or concentrated in one particular school or one particular grade level to be able to reduce any FTEs. But it's also worth noting, as you'll see on the next slide, as our staffing and enrollment has declined, we do anticipate um, an increase in enrollment in the next several years. Also, the population has shifted, not just here, but across the state of Connecticut. You will see as there's a decrease in overall enrollment, there is an increase of students with, uh, that require uh, special, uh, specialized programming. Again, that is not unique to Fairfield. That is something that is a trend across the state. We are at approximately 17% of our population that receives specialized instruction. And as you'll see here, this is the decline in enrollment across the state of Connecticut that has dipped significantly. But as you can see, the students that require specialized instruction has increased um, at a much higher rate than the decline in enrollment. And we're all aware that students that receive specialized instructions also come at a higher price tag. We like to compare ourselves to surrounding districts. We like to compare ourselves to what they say are DERG. Um, we also like to compare ourselves to districts that are here on the southern Fairfield coast. Um, as you can see, we're somewhere in the middle when it comes to per pupil expenditure. Um, that is something that I think is important to note because as we can see, we could be better and I'd like to see us a little bit better uh, over time. Uh, but we are by far not um, at the lower end, but we're, we're approximately in the middle. Um, but those that are behind us are more challenged because they are the larger cities in Norwalk, Bridgeport, and uh, Stratford, and Stanford that have other needs that they need to account for. So I think when you compare us to the New Canaan's, the Wilton's, the Darien's, Westport's, um, we could be a little bit more competitive. A lot of that I think we'll see next year um, and something we'll talk about in a minute is a teacher contract is coming up and negotiations will begin in the fall. Um, we are in the very low end of compensation. Uh, and we are falling farther and farther behind and competing with a competitive salary schedule. So that's something we do need to prepare for if we're gonna be able to re recruit and retain high quality teachers here in Fairfield. So we do have a couple of contrasting forces here. We have the contract pressures and mandates that we must fund. We also have the critical investments and cost management um, as we're trying to um, offset some of the costs that are, are, are putting pressure on the budget. Uh, we're looking at things uh, very methodically. Again, I started on November 1st, so getting to into the, the spring and the summer months and having an opportunity to look at the budget, look at how we deliver services over the next several months, I think will be critical as we prepare for next year's budget. Some of the items that, and shifts in the budget that we included this year are in preparation for some possible um, more efficiencies and, and, and things that we can be more effective in as we move forward. This is just a brief breakdown. I think everyone has probably seen some of uh, this in online, but there is the carryover uh, forward of staff and enrollment adjustments and benefits that we estimated um, through our contracts, uh, the maintenance of our plant and operations and transportation, uh, our IT and instructional contracts. We do and are planning to invest some of um, next year's budget into uh, the right to read legislation, if you're not familiar. Um, there are some reading programs uh, through the science of reading that have been approved statewide. Uh, we are one of several states across the nation that have implemented legislation around this. 
Um, it coincides with curriculum revision for the Fairfield Public Schools, so it's the right time to be able to have to um, invest in a reading resource that will help build our curriculum around to comply with state legislation. We also have to address the needs of our multilingual learners, our ESL students. We do have a shifting population with students that are coming from other countries that we are mandated to provide services for. Again, the paraeducator increase was significant, but also it's a significant investment in our, our staff that provide support for our highest need students. Um, a slight increase in adding another class for our early literacy academy that will add additional savings and cost avoidance as we move forward. We are investing in some additional mental health support. We have seen, and I'm sure you've heard, uh, across the nation, kids are struggling. Uh, they were struggling pre-pandemic. They're even struggling more as they come out of the pandemic when it comes to stress and anxiety. So we're looking to meet those needs as well. And again, special ed tuition, technology equipment, replacement and copier management are just some ways we're looking to offset some of the increase in next year's budget. Again, before I close, I just wanna just mention that we do look to remain competitive, um, establish practices for cost management, keep pace with investment, look to the future to maintain a quality school system. As we all know, most families come to Fairfield um, for the schools. And you know, I had a conversation today with a parent who was, uh, came here a year ago from New York and could not speak um, more highly of the quality of education here in the town of Fairfield. But again, we do have to be cognizant of the fact that uh, there are gonna be some key budget drivers as we look to the future, and the biggest one's going to be the teacher's contract next year. Thank you. Questions? <laughs> All right, thank you, that was a uh, a great summary. Um, so I want to turn it over to the board for questions. Ms. Marmion. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Welcome to Fairfield. Uh, that was a great presentation. Um, I do have a question that I didn't see specifically addressed in your budget, um, and that is the learning loss associated with COVID. And we've seen a lot of um, data on um, math and reading scores, et cetera. Um, and I know that we have, I'm very happy about the paraeducator compensation, the early literacy academy investment. I know we're, we're looking at a, an additional social worker, but can you point us directly to what in this budget might be um, that we can look at that will specifically address that learning loss and, and what you're doing or what you need to do? Well, I, I think one of the ways that we've already begun in my tenure to address learning loss in the district. Um, and some of it is left up on the wall from the other day is through professional development and really making sure that we have um, a focus on maintaining uh, grade level content, grade level instruction to our students. Um, one of the ways that w has been found to be successful since the pandemic in maintaining and catching students up is to not go backwards but to make sure that they stay exposed to grade level content. Um, so that's been the focus on our professional development with our school administrators and our coaches to make sure that as they're working with teachers that the focus is on challenging tasks and grade level instruction um, with additional support in, for those students that continue to struggle. Um, but we do have the, the personnel in place to be able to do that currently. You're welcome. Thank you, Ms. Marmion. Can I follow up on Ms. Marmion's question while yes, we're there? Yes, go ahead. How much money do you think is in the budget for to cover learning loss? Like, what would you, and, and what areas would that be in that we, that we would well, see that in? I think. To catch up. Because, and I, I know it's going to be years. I mean, we went over this last year um, with your predecessor and um, Ms. Vitale when she was in the position. Um, and I was on, you know, I got a complete explanation on that. But is there a way for you to judge that? And if you don't have the number today, could you get back to us with that? And the, and what the breakout in the budgets are for what is 
what is the cost of learning loss? Well, I think just to be very precise, I think everything that we invest in education throughout in the entire budget is addressing the needs of the students uh, across the district. I think there's an idea that you would have to do something additional in order to address what's been tapped as learning loss. I think it's our approach to teaching and learning moving forward, like I said, that will address any gaps that may have occurred. Um, but I think places like Fairfield, students have been more adjusted to what happened during the pandemic than other communities. Um, but I think we do have the personnel in place. It's just really a matter of not going backwards, as I said. That will just exasperate the problem going forward. So I think we've done a good job, and there's a lot of studies that have already come out saying that the gap has been closed um, in most communities uh, in, that look like Fairfield in terms of, of the effects of the pandemic. And I think we'll get a better understanding through our uh, spring assessment on Smarter Balance. All right, last year we were kind of pointed to certain areas that certain students needed extra help after school and sure. summer programs and all that stuff. That stuff wasn't there before COVID. That's a direct cost. W are there those costs been taken out of the budget? If, if they're in the budget, I would like to know what areas they are covered well, under. Well, we still have our BESSER money that will um, cover some of those programs, but I think it's also you know, a balance between how much you're going to offer in, it to, in additional tutoring and in, in summer programs because, um, you know, we, we have the, the, the mental health factor as well. So overloading students throughout the school year and then after school and then on, in the summer, um, there's a law of diminishing return as well. So uh, what I was told is a lot of the summer programs, a lot of the kids just want to go and go on trips go to camp and things like that, and that's okay. But we will be offering through our, with our BESSER money um, some summer programs for our highest need students in our ESY program and also other students that want to take advantage um, that need some help with reading and math. Okay, has our curriculum, and maybe I'm wrong on this, but I thought I'd heard this, are, are we covering everything in our curriculum full bore that we were covering pre-COVID? Are we covering every like part of the curriculum that was covered? That is the expectation. Now, I'm not asking about the expectation. Does the money in this budget get you to do that? Is yes. the, is that the plan? Yes. Because I don't think last year that was the plan. I, I thought there was we were we were talking about catching up, and some kids still being behind, and COVID effects, and all that stuff. Correct? I mean, for the people here last year. And that may have been the case, but we're a year removed from that, and we'll okay. be almost two years removed when we get into next year's budget. Okay, so I just want to be clear, and then, Mr. Chestnut, I, I appreciate it. Yeah. I, I really appreciate the presentation. I thought it was one of the better presentations I've seen, and I really appreciate the budget that was prepared by you and, and the board. Uh, but I just want to be clear going forward. To the best of the knowledge of you and the board, we have caught up from being behind on learning from COVID, and now we're moving forward, correct? When we look at the data um, from last year's spring assessment to pre-COVID, um, we are in good shape, yes. The data is clear that Fairfield students are, are doing well post-COVID. Now that doesn't mean there aren't students that are still struggling. Um, that's always gonna be the case. And that is our job to make sure that we can meet their needs through a multi-tier student support approach. Okay, thank you for that. That's my follow-up question. So if anybody else wants to take the floor, that was my follow-up to Ms. Marmion's. All right, thank you, Mr. Walsh. Loss. Okay, uh, other board members have any questions before we, Mr. Testani? Or I'm going to have to say Jack because, yeah, yes, and okay. We'll refer to the superintendent as the... Say uh, JT and MT. There you okay. go. Um, well, sort of along those same lines. So would you say that the pre-COVID learning loss is not, would you say it's not measurable? That's question one. Question two is you mentioned that 
<clears throat> the, you have data. What data are you referring to? And I personally, I have, for myself, I would love to look at that data that stipulates that the current students have caught up. Is that, did I understand that correctly? Yes, and it's available if anyone wants to go to the State Department of Education website under EdSite. The data across the state by school, by district is all available for everyone to view and drill down and it's all accessible to the public. And that's when you say across the state, I'm speaking of specifically a Fairfield. Yes, that's not Fairfield yes. so well. you okay. can do it by state, by district, uh, by grade level, mm -hmm. by school, in ELA, <coughs> math. SAT scores. That's what I'm, okay, yes. great. Thank you, that's it for now, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, other board members, Mr. Curley. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, welcome. Thank you for that presentation, I agree, it was excellent. Uh, and thank you all for all your co contributions to the budget. This is really uh, a good piece of work. Uh, so I appreciate the hard work that went into it. Um, I, uh, I'll probably have a few questions throughout, but I'll start with a couple and then turn it over. Um, I believe in, as customary, uh, the health insurance number in the budget is an estimate. I think it was quoted at 10% uh, or thereabouts, and the range is 8 to 10% is what you expect. Um, I guess my question is more around timing. Uh, when, when would that number be uh, finalized? Sure, so thank you for that question. Um, we got an update for that number about a week and a half ago. So they do, uh, the state, because of a bit of a challenge last year, decided to give a preliminary update um, so that they could avoid the problem we had last year. So the update was 7.1%, so pretty significantly different than what we budgeted. Um, the final rates will be re released in April. Um, there's an expectation and a hope that they would line up, but uh, we won't have the final rates until until April. And, and do you have a sense as to how, what that translates into in terms of dollars? It's it's uh, upwards of um, about five hundred thousand. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, and in in the um, first Black woman's presentation, she made mention of a uh, three hundred fifty thousand dollar FEMA grant that you were fortunate enough to receive. I understand that. Uh, um, that may or may not be finalized, or it may be uh, uh, received in advance of this upcoming year. I'm just trying to understand how that uh, yeah. links so timing-wise. It's not a grant. It's just FEMA reimbursement. Um, just like with any other natural disaster, there are certain items that you can apply for FEMA reimbursement, which the district did through the town uh, for PPE and such. So we will be receiving a reimbursement on expended dollars already, expended dollars of about $350,000. Uh, we should be receiving that, um, I would say, just to be safe, because you never know with delays, um, sometime in April. So that means it's not, uh, it's not really affecting this budget then? No, again, it was money that was spent already that will just come back to the district. I don't know if it was spent through operating budget. Courtney will be able to speak to that, or if it was spent through um, any of the initial federal dollars. But if that does come back, that could cover additional costs that we have um, that could be offered to other programs, such as summer programs next year um, and such. <clears throat> Maybe other items that are currently in limbo projects that are through facilities that we can put that towards. So we, that would be talked about once it's received. Do you have a follow-up? Um, sure, Mr. Walsh. So have you or the board talked about, and I, I just want to bring this up, or at least have it brought up as a discussion um, before we vote. Um, with this $350,000 coming in, um, I want to know how the board feels about using that $350,000 towards next year's budget by doing similar to what we did a couple of years ago when we got funding in for COVID. And there was going to be a significant amount of money that was going to be s surplus money that was going to be built into the built into the budget for the, say, current year, right now. And we did an agreement, a joint agreement between the town and between uh, the Board of Education. And I helped draft that agreement with Ms. Vitale. And I think it went pretty well with the town attorney. I think that was it. it might have been the three yeah. of us, and then we worked with our 
Uh, who yeah, else? I think we, we referred to yes. it as a non lap It was a yeah, non-lapsing account. I can't remember account. the name of it. Yeah. Then, so mm -hmm. the non-lapsing account. Right. So basically yeah. revitalize that or, or redraft that same type of account, and it would work the same way, meaning the money would come in this year. We would love be that. held in an account, and then we'd use it towards next year's budget. Well, we've talked about and we would love to have a non-lapsing account that we can have at our disposal. I mean, there are things that could unforeseeable things that could happen that mm -hmm. we would need to spend the money on. A boiler can go. Um, I've just recently spoken to a colleague where a student came and moved into the district from out of district with an IEP that um, was developed prior to leaving that required residential placement that is uh, costing the district $300,000 a year. So, I mean, there are a lot of unforeseen things that could uh, we could utilize uh, something like that, but... Yeah, but Again. maybe you're not understanding me. What I'm talking about in this non-lapsing account is that this, whatever this grant that comes in for FEMA would go into this non-lapsing account, and the agreement would specifically state that it would be used toward next year's budget hmm. year. So it would be applied to for expenses for the for your fiscal year 24 budget, towards your, your budget. And I think Ms. Laborious was very, has, we've dealt with, pretty well together. I thought it worked perfectly, to be quite honest with you. And that's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about putting in this $350,000 into um, a non-lapsing account for to be used for, you know, any time over the next 10 years or something. I'm talking about it being for a specific purpose. Okay. And, and I know that you don't have the authority. I mean, that's why Ms. Jacobson, I mean, that's why I'm asking you guys to talk about it. I think that would be a good partnership. It worked well the last time. And I think we would need, I, I would like, and I don't know how anybody else would like to hear about that and see your thoughts on it before we vote on your budget. Oh, to me, sir. Uh, yeah, so the Board of Education has not had a conversation on this item yet. It hasn't been on any of our agendas. It's relatively new information. Um, we're still, from my understanding, waiting for some specific details on it. I'm not entirely clear about how long we have to encumber and expend the funds, if there's any limitations on that and what it can be used for or not. You know, usually there's some sort of constraints on the use of federal funding. Um, so perhaps Ms. Lorries has more information at this time or hopefully we will get more information um, in the near future. But at this point in time, certainly can't speak on behalf of the board, but um, I'm interested in finding out more details about term in regard to how fast we have to spend it. Um, if there is a term, it might have to be spended by June. Um, in that totally case, agree. it wouldn't work. So there are some details still for us to find out about um, this funding and if there's any constraints on what it can exactly be spent on. So um, certainly I, open to having that conversation excellent. and doing that with the board. If excellent. I might, could I, could I inter answer that question, Jim? Sure. Is that okay? Um, there's no restriction um, from the Fed side, so it's cash that's being reimbursed. So it's the treatment that the town decides because it goes to the town how to utilize that cash. So it could be available for however it's stipulated. We are allowed to have a 1% or 2% total um, you know, of the total budget up to that max amount every year for the um, non-lapsing fund, if you will. So the terms would be developed by the town body and bodies, and then we would uh, uh, comply. Uh, in, in, in my previous district, we did have um, such non-lapsing fund where we would set it up out with targeted potential uses, and then if we needed to do transfers because something arose for a boiler, it would go through the town bodies. So there would be a decision about that if it was going to change from the original intention. Okay, That's on, a possibility. On this grant itself, so it's supposed to be for COVID things, and what, what's it supposed to be used for? It's a reimbursement. Grant? So yeah, we reimburse. spent operating what's, funds yeah. on uh, PPE, cleaning supplies, et cetera, and um, it was ta uh, town board of ed money. Um, that was not federal money because we're not allowed to double dip, and so we just got reimbursement for that in cash. Okay. And that amount, we we have over that uh, that amount to to get reimbursed for. So yeah, well, we've been reimbursed for 350. Yeah, we spent much more than that, but Good. we've been mm -hmm, reimbursed for 355,000. Great. Uh, so I would request um, uh, that that be looked at. And uh, if there's any other information that we need to know, as you find it out, if you could just let us know. If for some reason, there's not a way to do that. Um, you know, part of the way I, I will just let you know, I'm thinking about it. I know you guys started off with a, a surplus. And you have spent it. You pre-spent it on um, uh, buying the uh, computer devices for the, the, the children in advance, the Chromebooks in advance, and things like that, and for other things. So 
to me, there's already been a surplus <laughs> that you, you've had. And to me, with the economy the way it is, if we can save the taxpayers money but still try to fully fund you in a way, um, it, it would, I think it would do a lot of good, and I think there would be a lot of good faith in the town if we could do something like that. Hang on, I just wanna, um, I just wanna clarify because maybe, um, I just wanna make sure everyone is understanding what you're saying. I think that maybe the initial view was that you were saying let's carry this 350,000 over to next year, but I think what I just heard you say is that we, are you suggesting that we reduce the budget for next year, but then replace that money with this 350? Okay, so that would, that would so, mean basically that the budget next year would be neutral but that um, there would be a cut, theoretically. Yeah. All right. We, we can we can talk I, I, about that. I, I, I'm I'm really just looking for this three hundred fifty thousand dollars to yeah. be applied towards next, next year. Next year. Yeah. Ne next year's budget. Yeah. And I think we should we should talk about that. I mean, I, I think we did this um, during the pandemic budget, and uh, we created a giant cliff that was very difficult to deal with. And I think um, it's a great. Um, uh, it's a great option to have, and part of what comes to my mind is, yeah, you, know, you mentioned the the upcoming teacher contract a couple of times. I wanted to follow up with a question on that, but uh, yeah, <laughs> um, you know, I, I assume Courtney, do we have the cash at this point? Did the cash actually come in? It hasn't come in yet. We okay. got the letter of award, but the cash okay. Is not so here. if we have a letter of award for accounting purposes, this is going to hit the current year budget, and so we will have to take an action to apply it to next year's budget, and we can do that if the, if the board so chooses through a non-lapsing account, which is a, um, you know, a good option to have. So, um, yeah, so we can, we can um, you know, we don't have to take this up right now, but I, I do agree that it's a, it, you know, it, it's a good option to use it. Mr. Matola? Did, I thought you said a minute ago that the, the money's being paid to the town, right? Yes. So they don't have to give it to the Board of Ed, do they? No. No. Okay. So. But it was the Fairfield Public Schools right. that did the application for the funding. Right. And the town got reimbursed. So it's you. You have to work with. If the first select person woman wants to use this money to help you, she has. You have to get her blessing, right? I think she sort of indicated her she, blessing she, she already. She seemed like that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Yes. Can I, uh, Mr. Curley, go sorry, ahead. Sorry. Great. Thanks. Um, I, uh, thank you. And thanks for the follow up. Uh, and, and I would agree. I think the intention uh, of the first select woman, she made it pretty clear in her presentation that while she felt that this was a very strong budget, uh, that she felt that uh, a $500,000 cut was warranted. But in, in the same breath, she had talked about the news about the $350,000 reimbursement and how that would go a long way towards getting you back towards your full request. Um, so I think the spirit of what the first selectman described is consistent with what we've been talking about here. Um, um, but I, I wanted to make sure we were clear on the timing and understanding that if if there were any timing differences that, that this board did have a chance to take the actions if we needed to. So um, my, my next question, um, relates to the teacher's contract that you mentioned. Um, I see on line um, or page 11 of your book that, let me get there, uh, the, the different line items for the uh, salaries is listed. Uh, and it looks like there are about, I don't know, 12 to 15 different line items. Is the teacher's contract limited to the top line? I'm just trying to get a sense as to how big of the how big the slice of the pie is that they're, that's going to be up for renegotiation? The certified support staff as well, school administrative staff, but that's separate. They have their own contract. Um, so it would be certified support staff, teaching staff, so 101 and 103. So two line items uh, in the current budget uh, request that's roughly 90 million, 91 million. Thereabouts. Okay. Thereabouts, yes. Thank you. All right. Last question for me for now, and then I'll let my colleagues take a turn. Um, uh, <clears throat> on page 16 of your presentation tonight, um, you talked about uh, budget lines uh, with reductions, and that was really helpful. So thank you for providing that. But one one box in particular jumped out at me, and I didn't 
um, picked this up earlier, so I appreciate the presentation. Nursing services has roughly a $400,000 reduction. Uh, last night, uh, we had uh, a presentation from the health department, and they talked, we spent a lot of time talking about the, the nursing staff that they have and how they support the Board of Education and the education system. Uh, there were some increases on in that uh, budget. So I, I, I just want to better understand the dynamic between your budget for nursing, the town's budget for nursing, and, and how this $400,000 reduction relates to the increase that we saw last night. This has to do with projected one-to-one um, -one specialized nursing for students per their individual, individualized education plans. Um, so for medically fragile students who um, may require a one-to-one -one nurse to be with them all day or somebody who may need to have a nurse with them on the van. So this, this is separate from Jill Mitchell's um, department. This is really IEP mandates. And, and are you able to make these um, uh, budget projections based on actual data so you know exactly how many students are in this situation and therefore you can kind of build it from the bottom up? Yes. Thank you. Appreciate that. I have no further questions. Thank you. I just want to follow up on your, uh, on, on your question, Mr. Curley, before I go back to the board. So on the, um, and I know this is looking ahead, but since it's such a big issue, on the uh, teacher contract in this, this 90 million, uh, Mr. Tessani, you talked about the fact um, that we are at the low end of the scale in Fairfield and, and not necessarily competitive with uh, other communities in Fairfield County. Um, first, I want to say I, I also appreciate the fact that the, the paras got their, their increase this year. I never saw such a community meltdown as last year when there was a suggestion that we might reduce the number of paras. I think if anyone did not appreciate or understand how much the community appreciates uh, our paraeducators, it, it was uh, it was it was really evident uh, during last year's budget discussion. So I'm, I'm glad to hear about that and that we've gotten them up to a competitive level. Um, but but back to this 90 million. If you were to frame it in percentage terms, where do we stand versus I would say the average of of these other communities, I mean, are we two percent lower, five percent lower, ten percent? What are we? What are we talking? Well, I can just say a couple of years ago, I was doing a presentation for legislators um, and trying to give some context around teacher salaries and how low um, the neighboring municipalities' teacher salaries schedule was. Um, when I started to look at surrounding towns and to try to do a comparison. Uh, Let's just say I couldn't use Fairfield as a comparison. So, for example, a starting salary in um, a neighboring town is probably, for a master's degree teacher, where we're around 51, 52,000, they're around 56,000. Now, some of those other towns is, you know, um, have also settled teacher's contract this year and just to give you an idea, the average teacher contract settling around 12, 13% statewide uh, for three years. For, okay, <laughs> for three. <laughs> right, so they're getting fours. Okay. Yeah, fours. Fours, so they're getting fours. And so 51 to 56,000, so we're talking 10% roughly. 10%, right? 10 yeah. and, then, you know, and then they grow from there, obviously, depending on how many steps are in each of the salary schedules. We do have a significant number of, of steps to get to top, um, whereas other towns have uh, have less. Um, but I mean, I, we're not looking, and I'm not, I can't speak for the teachers what they're looking right. to do with the salary schedule and the steps. But I think when to, to start being more competitive in this job market, um, as we all know, it's harder and harder to find teachers. They're leaving in the first five years. I think a lot of that is if you look at salary schedule the first five years they don't get much of an increase um, the insurance costs have risen on behalf of the employer uh, the employee the uh, teacher retirement board de deduction has been raised over the last couple of years so they're getting squeezed and if we don't do something uh, we're going to see more and more of our young strong teachers leaving for districts like Norwalk um, and places like that that pay significantly more Okay, thank you. Yes, Mr. Curley. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just a quick follow-up on that. Just in terms of timing, I think you mentioned that, that the negotiations will start in the fall. I recognize that you also start your budget process in the fall. Um, and I understand every negotiation is unique and you can't project how long the negotiation will take, but typically, what would you expect that negotiation to take, three months? I, I don't, I mean, I don't foresee it. I think, you know, I've been on both sides of the table uh, in negotiations. I think unless there's contract language that the, uh, the bargaining unit is really s stuck on trying to change, uh, I really think it all comes down to salary and, and benefit contribution. And I think that's going to be um, something that hopefully we can come to a resolution soon and not have to go through the, um, the, the mediation and then the arbitration process. But I, I don't think anyone wants to get there. Um, those are always difficult to, to go through. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Welsh? Uh, quick follow-up on the teacher's contract. Uh, I will say the last contract, which I think was well negotiated by Jeff and myself, we're still president. We could be on that team. We did a great job the last time we, with we, Ms. We Vitale. run the administrator's contract, not the teacher's <laughs> contract. What? Well, I was on you both. and I were administrators. Oh, I was on the other one, too. So sorry, you weren't there. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I'm the only one left. Yeah. Um, anyway, um, I uh, wanted to follow up on Mr. Curley's questions regards to the nursing costs, because I also had that question and the, um, the discrepancy between the negative number and what we were hearing from, I think her name was Jill, um, last night. Um, so she mentioned that next year was going to be a difficult year at the high schools because projections on the number of students going to the high schools was increasing. But when I look at your book on high school projections, 9 through 12, it shows a decrease, and that confused me because she said it was increasing and that she was afraid for next year at the high school. So I'm a little... Mr. Walsh, would you mind pointing everyone to the page you're looking at? Thank you. It is page... 142, bottom left-hand corner, enrollment projections for grades 9 through 12. So it shows this 22 to 23 being 2,983, going down to 2,949. And Jill told us last night she was extremely concerned about what was going to be happening at the high school. That's my recollection. I had a conversation with her this morning, and I think um, the conversation was really around the frequency of students visiting the nurse has increased since COVID. And that was at the elementary school? Uh, no, at the high school at as well. School. So okay. um, we have scheduled a meeting for next week to just go over specifically. Um, a question was raised by Ms. Vitale, and I think it's a great question as to is it sheer volume of students? Is it the frequency of a smaller subgroup of students? Really to understand what data is being collected. And if we're not doing a great job in capturing that, to, in, to look at ways from now till the end of the school year to capture more data as to um, what is the cause of the frequent increase in frequency of visits to the nurse. Um, I think a lot of it does have to do um, with students that are looking for uh, support around mental health needs, uh, counselors. Um, we have not added any additional counselors, so um, this is the time of year they're all working, and they have been working on you know the college um, process and and FAFSA and all those things. So I'm not sure if the overflow then reaches the nurses' office, um, and sometimes I think the nurses are seeing these kids because they're exhibiting physical symptoms as. It, as a way, um, as a result of the, the stresses that they're feeling and the trauma. Okay. And she had some number, I think it was 200 and something percent increase. Did she talk to you about that? Yes, uh, and I, that's why I think we need to have a deeper conversation because I know they do log the, the reason why the student mm -hmm. is in the nurse. Um, some of it could be we had a, a pretty rough flu season could be still some effects of COVID, but I do think a lot of students 
um, are experiencing physical symptoms due to the anxiety and the stress and the trauma they've been dealing with. So um, there's a lot of that happening uh, just nationwide. Uh, our kids are struggling. Okay. Um, I, I will say one of the things that concerned me was she said that, you know, I can't remember the percent she said, but a high percent were for mental health issues. And I asked her whether the nurses were trained in mental health issues, and she said, no, they're not. Some of them take extra courses, but they're not. And that surprised me. She said they have to wait to see a counselor. Some of them just need to, I can't remember the name of the term she used, just relax, maybe go in a dark room, things like that uh, for a period of time. But, you know, I, I guess if you could, I guess during the year, come back to us and advise us, like, what, what's going on? Because when, you hear, when I hear mental health issues and there's not somebody who's trained in that area, it's a concern. I, I think the nurse is a good resource to help uh, connect students and families to medical providers outside of school as well. Uh, but again, these are deeper discussions that um, we touched upon briefly this morning, but we'll get into a little deeper next week. Uh, Madam Chair, can I follow up on that? Sure. I just uh, so, so I'm clear, in this page with the budget lines with the reductions, Mr. Mancusi referenced, and I understand it, that that nursing services line in that piece of the presentation, which reduces it by 397,300, he referenced that that piece of nursing services, that reference is for the IOP, is that? IEPs. I, if, uh, I'm sorry. The IEPs. I am sorry, I used the wrong nomenclature, but so that's, Definitely going down, if I understand it correctly, the other piece that we discussed in last night is increasing. Am I, I'm following that correctly. Okay, so could, is it possible that it could change because of some of these fluctuations we're talking about as a result of your meeting, I think you said it was next week? So the, would the reduction be less? Could it be more? Or we don't know yet, right? Yeah, I don't know line. what her ask was for the nurses that she supervises. Could what Ms. Mr. Mancusi mentioned, could that be reduced? Yeah, I mean, we could have a family move into Fairfield that has a child that requires um, nursing services, and we would have to provide it. So, you know, it's, it's something that could change. We're just going by what the current enrollment is and the students that require it now. And so if I understand this reduction of the 397-300 is based on the current, is that right, Mr. Mancusi? Current and projected, and it may also um, include like instead of hiring an RN um, for a student, we're able to hire an LPN or, or nurse's aide. Right. We do consult with um, Jill Mitchell on those, but they are two different types of services. One is IEP mandated on this. What you heard last night was, was um, you know, had to do with the increase in the volume of students or the number of students visiting the nurse's office. Okay, great, thank you. Um, one, I'm sorry, one, one quick thing on the salary competitiveness you were discussing earlier. Do you have a chart? I know you said Fairfield hasn't caught up. Is that reflected in the DERG projections that you provided us, the salary? Um, or the, I understand that's the per pupil spending. I'm just, I would like to see if you have it, some uh, data that sure. corresponds with how Fairfield salaries versus I can get you some, some of, of the other surrounding sure. communities. I, I like, I'm sure the other board members would want the town to remain competitive as well. Sure. And it is, I know we all referenced this great presentation. I just want to say in the time I've been here, it's the best I've seen, honestly. It's really, I, I really just good. Give you Very good. Something I wanted to share so that you have an understanding. This was, uh, I read this yesterday in a there was a study done uh, over the last six months regarding teacher salaries. And if you account for inflation um, since uh, the year 1989-90 um, with adjusted inflation, teacher salaries have gone up $83. Is that unique to Connecticut? Is that across the country? That's across the country. Okay. 
Yeah, but you have, in terms of specific to Fairfield, you have it versus yeah, the I other. Yeah, I can get you some comparative okay. numbers from surrounding towns okay, that we great. normally I, compete with. I don't want to give Miss Laborious more work, but. Uh, no, they're easy to find. I, okay. I, have, I probably have it still on my I computer. mean, after this, it looked like she put a lot of work into this, yes. so I appreciate it. Thank you, and as did you, I'm sure. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Ms. Mermian. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on the increase of um, students going to the nurse because I was listening last night and I was also um, kind of concerned that maybe we should be looking at um, adding more, you know, counselors, psychologists, et cetera, if so much of this is driven by uh, mental health. But then um, she said something which I found interesting, which is that a lot of times there's a physical symptom to your anxiety. So you might say, I, ha I feel nauseous, I have a stomach ache, I'm going to throw up. That's a physical manifestation of the anxiety or whatever it is right. going on. So it's appropriate for the teacher to send the student to the nurse, have that checked up. Maybe they realize it, it's anxiety, but I think that's driving some of those nursing visits, if I'm Absolutely. not wrong. Absolutely. There are physical symptoms that are um, results of children just really st stressed out. Thank you, Ms. Marmion. Uh, Mr. Stark. Uh, just a few random questions and observations. The first of which would be that teachers aren't the only ones. Um, middle class salaries in general in the United States have been stagnant since the 1960s. Uh, if you look at the Pew Research Institute study done in, in 2018, you can see, for example, that in constant 2018 dollars, um, average paycheck of $20.27 in 1964, stands at $22.65 as Madam Chair, what does this have to do with the Board of Ed? Uh, Jack. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. It has yeah. plenty to do with the Board of Ed. And if you interrupt me again, well, we're going to have an issue okay. again. Okay, good. Go ahead. Okay. All right. Let's Thanks. have the issue now then. Okay. Why but for it? Stark, Why do you go need for to it, interrupt Stark. other people when they speak? I wanted You're the to only know, person well, who does all, this. Well, first of all, it's a point of order. That's Boys. number one. Number two, I'm <laughs> entitled to interrupt All right, gentlemen, anytime um, I want. And if you don't like it, it's too bad. I, okay. I noticed How's that, that when he interrupted. Can, can, uh, Mr. Stark, I, I really want to hear your question, can, and I, I appreciate it. Can you, can you go ahead? Thank you. So you were talking about teacher salaries <laughs> and, uh, and how that's consistent with other, but can you keep going with that? Uh, I, I'm, and I don't say that to be unsympathetic to the fact that teachers should be paid more. Um, the, the other, the related question I had though is, do you know what percentage of your employees actually live in the town of Fairfield? I was given a number when I first started back in November from the teachers union president that about 33%, almost a third of the teachers live here in town. That was the number that was provided by the FEA, roughly a third of the teachers, that was the number provided by the FEA. Okay, and I'm, and I'm sorry if some members of the board aren't able to keep up with a uh, Socratic argument that requires multiple steps to build up to it. Um, maybe we'll get there someday. Now here's the unrelated question. If we could talk to the um, actual budget book that you uh, put in front of us, um, it's page, 28 of the PDF backup, uh, but it's page 12 of your budget book. And, and I'm just asking about this more to understand than anything. I was just curious, what does the, in, the uh, I guess it's a reclassification of the elementary program facilitators into assistant principals? Yes. Uh, what, what does that actually accomplish like from an educational perspective? Well, the current positions uh, have no supervisory um, authority whatsoever over staffing. So they are there in a quasi role, um, whereas an assistant principal will be able to supervise teachers, evaluate teachers and staff. Um, they're not bound by the, um, the, the, the restrictions of the teacher's contract because they are not teachers, they are admins. Okay, and then, uh I think in a couple of different places you point to demogra demographic changes um, causing number of staff to overall increase, I guess. Um, I was wondering if you could uh, give us some color around that. It does look like in the pages that follow that um, 
Dwight is losing teaching staff? Is that similarly due to demographics? If you look at the pages that follow, like 13 through 20 something, you see the school by school changes in FTEs and salaries? There, there is a page that does summarize all of the staffing changes um, in the back of the book that might be helpful. But Dwight's, uh, like all the elementary school staffing is based on a board approved staffing model that's based on the projected population of students at the school. So there's class size assumptions that drive. So if the population of the school is going down, then um, FTE would drop, reduce also. Um, but if you look at page 160 is probably a good summary change, uh, summary of all the staffing changes that are happening. Yes. Of the budget book. That's it for now. Thank you, Mr. Stark. Uh, Ms. Marmion. Hi, I have a question. It's somewhat related to enrollment, but not really. I know that um, we're looking at redistricting. Um, there's been a lot of conversation. Um, and I'm wondering about any costs in next year's budget related to redistricting. I know we typically hire um, consultants, uh, I'm going to get it wrong, Muldoon and something, I can't remember what they're called, Milbra, whatever. But you know what I'm talking about. So um, in terms of timing uh, for next year's budget with the redistricting program, um, are we, where are the costs and can we find them, if there are any? They're found in contracted services. Uh, can you um, show me, uh, point us to the page? Uh, sure. Page 49 is the summary of contracted services and the detail can be found on page 50. Specifically, section 305. Eight, there's, uh, we always have funding, um, Ms. Marmion, for a one-year enrollment projection. Um, that we go that we have every year in our budget, but for next year, you'll see in section 305 of the narrative that there is thirty thousand dollars appropriated in next year's budget towards the continuation of those discussions and planning um, to the consultant. Sorry, Jen, that there's fifty, but it's a year-over-year -year increase of thirty. I apologize if that wasn't clear in the write-up. Okay, so increase. there's just for the consultant, and that's all you're budgeting for next year in terms of redistricting. Is that correct? Well, just to be specific, the redistricting is targeted to begin for the 24-25 school year, so be, uh, next year's budget is going to... That was my question. The only cost that we can find is for that um, consultant. Correct. That's still the work that we are, we're engaged in right now. All right. Thank you. Can I follow up Min on Ms. Marmion's question? Yes, thank you. I mean, no decision has been made about redistricting, correct? No. Uh, at, at this point, we have uh, the board has prepared a charge yes. to our consultant. Our mm -hmm. consultant will provide us with uh, uh, potential scenarios yes. in the coming months that we will then uh, debate, yes. refine yes. until until the fall yes. vote by the board. I just want to confirm you're still yeah. uh, you're still kind of in the October time frame to maybe having maybe a vote or at least having all the yeah, information to start coming to a decision? Yes, and, and again, like the, that time frame matters because of the budget construction yes. that will, administration will be going through at that point in time. Yeah, because I presume that redistricting would cost a lot more than the 50 that's in the budget for next year. There will likely be a lot of moving parts. Yes, so, okay, just, I just, that's what I thought. I was just, you know, thank you for going over that. And Ms. Marmion, thank you for the question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Walsh. Um, other questions? Um, I, I have a quick one. Um, well, maybe it's not quick, but early the early literacy program, and uh, I apologize, I haven't, I'm sure you've discussed this at length in the Board of Ed meetings, and I haven't watched many of them. Can you talk to us a little bit more about uh, the program? I see the cost, but more about what, what the um, intent is in terms of, uh, you know, not just, you know, in, in general, uh, cost avoidance um, in the future, um, student, you know, experience, et cetera. The Early Literacy Academy is our in-district program to meet the needs of our um, most severely um, disabled students with language-based disabilities or dyslexia primarily. Um, it's an elementary program 
So we partnered with um, an organization called Literacy How, and um, which is seen by Dr. Margie Gillis, who is well known um, in the field of early literacy. She is a state consultant. She's helped in the selection of the reading programs that we're looking at as part of the, um, the new legislation. And um, she's chosen to work with us. It's not a big organization, but she's highly respected in the field. Um, it's our attempt to keep our most severely disabled kids in that area, in district, versus having to spend say $70,000 for a student to be placed in either a special ed school who's, who specializes in that area or one of the private schools in this area. We are in an area geographically where there are a lot of private schools that um, try to attract our, our parents um, and our students. And I, I think the program that we're put, we put together, we're in our second year, um, I would put our program up against any private school program in the area of, you know, meeting the needs of students with dyslexia. Um, because of our relationship with Margie Gillis and Literacy How and the training that is involved. Part of the Early Literacy Academy also has a professional development component to it, which requires all special education teachers and general education teachers who work with students with disabilities in, in the program to go through a five month um, professional development um, or professional learning series so they're able to meet the needs of our students across all settings. So um, right now we have 15 students. We're projecting that we project, uh, we increase that by eight, student, eight students next year. So that's where the savings comes in because these are students who would, um, you know, often need to be outplaced at the cost of $70,000 or whatever next year's tuitions are going up. Um, so that's where the cost avoidance is. We have one teacher per cohort. So next year we'll have our third cohort. And then there's two literacy paras um, in each of the cohorts. Uh, thank you for that. Can you, um, and I thought I saw in the book, can you talk a little bit about um, and still on the subject of cost avoidance, uh, tuition. Did I read somewhere that the tuition costs for those students that are um, placed outside the district are, are increasing substantially? It's significantly increasing. And depending on the needs of the students and the type of um, learning profile that students have, we have, and primarily we talk about day programs because ob obviously students who are residentially placed, it's a lot more expensive. But for day programs, a, um, a low cost day therapeutic day program is, is about $70,000. Uh, a higher cost program could go upwards of $150,000 and that's just a day program. If you're talking about residential placements, it, it can, as Mr. Testani said, depending on the needs, it can go into hundreds of thousands of dollars. Okay, and since my uh, my friend Mr. Dewitt is not here, I'll, I just want to ask a question in his honor, because <laughs> he he always asks about Walter Fitzgerald, and um, you know since we uh, you know moved into the Giant Steps facility, you know what we, have we been um, a, attracting students in district uh, from from other towns, and you know what does that look like in terms of numbers and dollars? Currently, we do not have any. Um out-of-town tuition students at Walter Fitzgerald. We continue to be in contact with, with uh, our colleagues in other districts. We had a potential referral, but the district chose to send and the parent chose for the student to go elsewhere. Um, we are in constant contact, though, with our colleagues from other districts to promote our program. Um, so we have five spots set aside for tuition students right now. Our base tuition is $35,000, and then obviously additional costs if the student has an IEP and needs IEP services or a 504 plan. Currently, we have about, I think, 44 students at Walter Fitzgerald, so we continue to grow our population there. We're very proud of our program, and uh, I, I think, again, as an alternative program, um, and Mr. Testani's um, expertise in that area is really helping us, you know, continue to improve the quality of programming we offer to our students at Walter Fitzgerald campus. And, and just to add to that, we are looking to promote the program. 
uh, when when Rob mentioned to me that we are able to take tuition students from out of district, um, I can tell you I spoke to colleagues in the immediate area and they were not aware that they had the ability to uh, work with Fairfield to send students to to the campus. So they are aware now and um, so they will potentially be referring students uh, to Walter Fitzgerald in the future. Thank you for that. And 44 students, that, just going by memory, that seems quite a bit higher. What did you start out with when we first? Oh, it, it, it was low 20s, high teens. Okay, yeah, that was what I remembered. So all of those students potentially might, you know, might have otherwise been um, outplaced. Outplaced. Yes. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Walsh. I wanted to follow up on Mr. Stark's question um, in regards to the Dwight, um, I guess enrollment and, because I don't see us losing a teacher there, is am I correct? Uh, I think that I'm gonna direct you to page 145. Dwight is in the middle of the three schools on the left-hand side and the first budget is the 20, fiscal year 23 budget and the far right is the 20 fiscal year 24. I just want to make sure I'm reading this correct. So, so we're going down in number of students or the projection is to go from 252 students, correct? And to go down to 236. But there's no, we're not losing a section there, correct? It says zero? Correct, yeah. The one at, at threshold didn't come to fruition, and so the middle is the actual. So we were at 12 sections this year, and we'll be, we're projected to be at 12 next year. Okay. Um, even, though the, even though the numbers at Dwight seem to continue to go down, downward, correct? Yes, because of the uh, class size requirement yeah. or, or uh, rule that we've established. Okay. Actually, the class size would not be able to be accommodated anywhere um, with the numbers that we currently have. There's not a district that would allow more than uh, 29 is the largest that any district that I'm aware of mm -hmm. contractually allows. So yeah, and that's a lot of kids to have in one class. And what's the capacity of Dwight? What? 378. Okay. Uh, okay. So I guess that's one of the issues you guys will be looking at. How do we drive that, though, with what I was pointing at on um, page? Yeah, I'm sure the answer is correct in here somewhere. I'm just not getting it. Uh, it's almost too much information. Um, page, the page uh, 15 that I was pointing to, where you look at Dwight, and it shows FTEs. I mean, FTEs aren't going down versus actual, but they're going down versus budgeted last year's budget. That's what I probably inelegantly failed to say. You had 23.2 uh, budgeted for this fiscal year. Actual seems to be only 19.8, and then you're just continuing that. Is that the right read of that? That is the right read of that. Um, that's odd. That's what I was asking about. Why is that? Is that also <laughs> because the CLC moved? Yeah, that's exactly it. So if you look at Burr, right, you'd see an increase of the... Oh, there I'm used sorry, to be no, no. a CLC at Dwight last, and then we had been budgeted. But Mr. Um, the previous administration removed the CLC or moved it to Mill Hill, so there was some movement of um, staff from Dwight to Mill Hill. Okay, is that demographically driven or no? The CLC program, okay. Complex Learner Cohort. There was it was located at Dwight School previously, yeah. oh, and for this year moved. it moved yeah. to Mill Hill. Mm -hmm. So in, in the future, we'll break those out separately so you can see the CLC teachers. I think that might be helpful. Thank you, Mr. Stark. Mr. Tassani? Yeah. So just want to go back, uh, Mr. Incusi, real quick to the Walter Fitzgerald. Uh, if I heard you, did you say f we have currently we have 44? Is that right? Yes. Around What's our there. capacity there? I, I also am kind of blown away by that number, having remembered going through the building with actually nothing there when we first considered bringing it on board with the first select woman's direction and making it a, a board of ed facility, so to speak, uh, with just to have it at 44 is amazing. 
And I'm sorry, what is the capacity, do you think? We previously had set a soft like limit when we were down in the teens. We believe we can we can program for around 60 students there. And what's the teacher, what's the ratio? We have, it's the ratio, we have four regular ed teachers in all the core academic areas. We have um, two special ed teachers. We have a school psychologist. We have a social worker, a school counselor, um, and a principal. So we, we have the staff to student ratio is, is favorable there. Uh, that's fantastic. And I'm just curious, how are the, the people receiving it? I mean, again, I'm thinking about this old room that had like nothing in it other than like some water from leaking and stuff like that when, <laughs> when we look through it. So I just, I'm obviously it's been all renovated and stuff. I just wondered how is the neighborhood and the community we see, I'm sure it's gotta be favorable to have the, those kinds of increases. We love our new, our, our new location. In terms of that's driving good, through Barbary Street, we- Call the first we, woman and tell her. <laughs> no, we, we love being there. And we, we drive slowly when we drive on Barbary. Can I just clarify something quickly? There are actually, on the, on the side of the property, there are two buildings there. The one that I think you were talking about, the kind of concrete shell, is not where our kids are now. We, we, so. I, I understand that. I just was remembering the entire complex. No. And, the, and, and I, I do want to say thank you for the, you know, for the, for the Board of Finance's support in, in buying the, the former Giant Steps facility, which was being used right up until we moved into it. So, so it's, yeah. Uh, thank you. No, I, I'd say we could make revenue on that other building on the site. To for like Night of the Living Dead show, you could probably rent it out, uh, rent it out to the movie scene. <laughs> yeah. All right. I, thank um, you. I, I will say I think that was one of the best things, purchases for for not only um, the district and and, and the program, um, but I, I I sometimes have nightmares about with these eight thirty G laws and what I'm seeing around town. Uh, like there would be a thousand apartments there right now because the property is so large. Uh, it, it would have been four stories. It would have been, it would have been a crazy situation. So I think it was, uh, you know, kudos for you for making use of it for the program. Kudos to the first select woman for put it, putting, putting that together and jumping on it and for all the town bodies to support it. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. Um, I, uh, I have a question about um, bus drivers. Um, can you just clarify the, the way this has been characterized in the book is we have accounted for the driver shortage in our transportation budget. Um, what does that exactly mean? Does it mean that we know we won't have enough bus drivers, so we've lowered the budget, but is that a sustainable number? Can you just talk about that a little bit? We, we lowered it to a point that we know um, it's a realistic number to, to get to, uh, but it will not cause, uh, it'll actually improve the service that we're providing this year. Um, we have added some drivers over the last couple of weeks uh, working with First Student. Um, we've made some adjustments in our transportation department, which it seems have um, opened up um, some additional drivers getting on board. So we're very hopeful, um, but we just lowered the number because uh, we think we can optimally um, operate with the number that we propose. Okay, and, and thank you. I guess, and just to make sure I'm clear, when we say accounting for the driver shortage, so it sounds like you can make do fine with what you've got. Is, is this to imply that if more drivers were available, we would have had more drivers and more buses? What are, is, or, is, or are we at the optimal number. Just accounting for the driver shortage just sort of implies that you are. So when we were building the budget, it was a, it seemed that from working with our transportation department, it was uh, accounting for the shortage. As now some changes have been made within the department and we're working with the bus company, we believe this number is the ideal number for us. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, other questions? 
Mr. Welsh. I'm going to ask a couple questions in on regards to page 138, this Fairfield County per pupil expenditures. And Mr. Testani, you may, um, this is our first time before us, but I think the rest of your team knows I ask some questions about this page every year because um, sometimes I think that the numbers, uh, when, when we look at it this way, it's a little skewed. Um, so I want to ask some questions and then uh, it's about it because kind of looks like, oh, we're falling behind the average and things like that. So what are these definitions? So like when I see like most of these above us are Durgays other than Greenwich, correct? What's correct. the definition of like Durgay? Is it just a number of towns that were put together, or did the state put that together, or somebody put that together based on population? Or what is the definition of A? Wealth. Wealthy? That's what I thought. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I know so where you're going with this. If they're wealthier yeah. towns, they're going to spend more money. Well, yeah. I mean, clearly, look at these towns. If I asked you to give me a chart and said, give me the average wealth on average per person in the town, we'd be a lot lower. We'd still be in the same spot, right? Most likely. Yes. <laughs> I mean, serious. I mean, by a lot. In, in some situations, compared to Greenwich... But they definitely don't, compared but, to but definitely, they definitely compared to Darien. They definitely don't have um, the commercial tax base either. Um, so they are. Some of them do. Greenwich has a, a Greenwich, large. Well, yeah, we'll, yeah. We'll, we'll exclude. Greenwich. Sure. Yep. <laughs> That's why they're in Dirk B. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, can I follow up on that? Sure. Um, so on page four, too. Um, I know you're looking at a different page. We do always provide. What um, page? Sorry. Page four. We four. do always provide our wealth rank as our town as calculated by OPM um, and the state and to relative to our PPE rank for reference. So I'm not sure that, I'm not sure what you mean by the statement. We would be in the same place. Um, if you were suggesting that we would be in the below average of the state or what you meant by that, but um, we do provide that information for you in every budget book. Four. Okay. But every one of the communities listed above us would be higher in wealth rank. Is higher, right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, on page four, I don't see like the other towns. This is just this is per year what our what our ranking was, I guess. Yes. Uh, the 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 Anglic, the Connecticut Anglic wealth rankings and the PP adjusted rankings. equalized net grand list. Yep. So uh, obviously, communities with people of greater wealth can easily spend more taxes. And generally, the house size is a lot larger. Their wealth rank is larger than ours. Like it would be like comparing people from like the, the same thing to Bridgeport and comparing it against these other people. So where are we? Why don't we get a page, I guess, is the question, of where we stand in our Dirk. If you uh, but just yeah, one, I one, might have missed it. One kind of detail: if you if you look on the bottom of, of this page, those orange circles uh, have where our Anglic rank is relative in other towns. So Greenwich and Dirk A or, yep. or Dirk B is, is a is, is a one. They're, yep. they're they're Anglic one. Yep. Okay. And we're number eighteen. Okay. Where do where do we stand in regards to this PPE in regards to our Dirk? We used to sometimes it used to be included in the in in the package in the it, in pre previously. Yeah, I, I think to your point earlier too, it is uh, challenging to compare because size, so and other factors, so the unique needs of a district. So we have a commercial base. We're big. We're in Fairfield County. Mm -hmm. We're not as wealthy as the Durgays, but we're like Durgays in some ways. So it is challenging to compare. But um, we do have the Durg B info. We're, we're, we're we'd be happy to share that. If yeah, that's if, you of could, if, you, if you could supply that, that'd be great. I'm going to follow up one more time. Um, so the state is no longer using Durgs. The Durg Dergs were created in 2006. They've never been touched since. So anyone who does finance projections, like organizations, school finance project, whatever, would have, have long put us in Derg A at this point. Um, so the state isn't even using those anymore. And then for Derg Bs from that time, 2006 backwards, um, going forward, many of those towns, um, I'm sure we can put it together for you, but they're not located in Fairfield County. So just you know, speaking on my own behalf, um, so the towns that are in this chart 
are who are around us and who our kids are competing with and who we are competing for for staff and, and employment and programming and for college admissions and programming and sports and everything else. So um, it, the DERG reference is very antiquated at this point. It's also to look at who is around us and who, are, who is our district competing with and who are our kids competing for for resources. So okay. um, that would be my point on that. So, when I look at like Westport's education budget, you know what they love to do from what I see? They love administration. They pile it on. I mean, it's, cra it's crazy how much, how, how much administration they have. And, I, I, well, it might be worth, you know, we're, we're comparing ourselves here to them, right, on this page. So it's just interesting to look from budget to budget because they're all online. Um, but it, it's just interesting how different communities have different... Um, I guess educational systems, because for some reason, and and real estate didn't sell this. Like Westport's supposed to be like, if you really love your kid, you should live there, <laughs> because because I'm going to pay all this extra money and extra taxes and and God knows extra money in in purchasing a house to live there. Now I don't think they really perform much better, but. <laughs> Their model's like so much different than our model. Well, well and I was just going to say, they are heavy uh, at an, on administration. I don't know for certain what is the um, the net loss as a result of I that. I don't see any. Well, no, well, well, what I'm saying is I know at the elementary level, for example, they have uh, three administrators in a building, a principal and two assistant principals. That additional assistant principal, I believe, focuses solely on academics. Um, so that may be in place of a literacy coach or a math. I, I can't say for certain, but that's the, the model they may use mm -hmm. because um, it just provides them, in their opinion, maybe with better oversight, um, better training. I, I, I can't say, but I, I could look into it because I, I do think, and as I mentioned in the presentation, this budget is a precursor to building something different here. Um, that maybe our model could look differently as well. Okay. And to follow that up, um, and I've asked your predecessors this, so I think your staff's used to me asking the same question, and is to me the price isn't putting. So uh, how are the students performing? Are they performing better, worse than last year? Right. On testing. And it, can you supply us with some type of measurements on that? Well, the only common assessment that yep. is used statewide is the Smarter Balance Assessment mm -hmm. and the SAT. Okay. Um, we have not taken the exam this year yet. It's mm -hmm. coming up in the coming weeks. Okay. Um, and then when we receive that data, we'll do a comparison. Uh, but we'll do a growth comparison. I think that's the only fair way to do it. So we're comparing this year's fourth graders with their, their scores from third grade last year and seeing what kind of growth that will tell us. You yes. know, a lot of times people look at third grade to third grade, different cohorts of kids. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to see some variance. Um, ne not necessarily uh, going to tell you much. So we will have that data early summer okay, um, to be able to do some, some deep diving into that and see what we can do and All right. in terms of how we address areas that we are uh, weaker in. Okay. Would you be able to present that data and to give us a better assessment at that time? Sure. Maybe at a quarterly meeting where maybe you could also, you know, in case other questions come up or some other meeting that you have to be at, can you work with Ms. Charlton on that? Sure. It's on when the state releases the results. So yeah. this kids take it March, April. We usually don't even get results, um, you know. March, April, May. Yeah, and the, till the summer usually is when they yeah, get summer. released. So when I've asked your predecessors this, everyone's like, well, no, our students are doing really well, you know. And so sometimes I feel like we, you know, it's this page is kind of looked at as like, oh, my God, you're spending below this average of the, of the communities that we have here. But yet we're performing well, as well as some of these other communities, right? So I never want to apologize for getting a great product and spending less. I, I don't think that's something you should have to apologize for or I should have to defend. It's just, it's just maybe we just do things better. 
Maybe, in, maybe instead of a West Sports model, we take our money and don't put it all to administration, right. and we put it towards teaching and other programs and better special education and investing in special education, whatever that is. Do you, do you, do you yeah, see no, where I'm coming from on that? I, I think it all depends on how you look at this bar graph. I don't look at it as a way to show that we're behind and we're asking for more money so we can be on par with Weston, for example. We, we'll throw Greenwich out. I look at it to say this justifies that we're not asking for an unreasonable amount of an increase because we are below the state average and we're somewhere in the middle of Fairfield County. So it's not, hey, to try to shame this body or any other body into giving us more money so that we can be up to 24,262. It's just to say, this is a reasonable ask, yeah, because this is where it puts us. Yes. So I, that's the, the way I look at it, but I can see how other folks look at it as a way of saying, we're being underfunded, so give us more. Yeah, I mean, I, and just the opposite. If, if I saw that the scores that we're performing to have started going down, yeah, I would think that maybe we should probably invest a little bit more right. for a better product. Gotcha. Huh. So, uh, but anyway. You could I, spin I, this either way. I, I, I know, and that's, ago, that's, and that's the weird thing about the page is that, you know, you look at it and you're like, oh, my God, are, are, are we really below average? A year you know, ago, I spun the number in a way because of the lack of performance attributed to the lack of resources. Yes. So it, it, it could be spun either way. Yes, and I've asked, and I've read studies on this, and I've asked your predecessors, if we all of a sudden decide to pump 25 or $30 million more in the education system, are you promising me that I'm going to get better scores? And they've all said, no. Because studies have shown that just throwing money, now obviously if you're not spending money appropriately, you might see better results. Uh, but if just throwing money at a program does not mean that your test scores are going to start going up and things like that. Correct. Do you agree with that? Correct. Okay. Okay. That's all I have in that area, unless anybody has any follow-ups. Uh, Welsh, Mr. Testani. I, I actually do have a follow-up. Uh, so, uh, stop me if I'm wrong. With the DERG, so this chart is the per-pupil spending, right? And to sort of dovetail off one of the things Mr. Walsh was referring to, is there a chart that sort of gives us an idea of performance by DERG based on perhaps math scores, science scores, obviously not this year, but perhaps last year. So how did we, how did we, meaning Fairfield, compare in our DERG versus other towns for a particular subject area, or is it measured that way? Can I, can I follow? Well, it's not measured that way, but we look at the data that's in front of us. I, I don't like to compare us to other s districts. Um, different kids, different circumstances, different um, student body demographic makeup, but I think it's a slippery slope to start comparing. Um, you know, when we have 9,300 kids, another district may have 2,200. Um, obviously different challenges. And also, I'm just gonna piggyback on that, and, and what data? You, do you want ELL data? Do you want special ed data? Do you want third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, eighth grade, twelfth grade? Do you want male, female, um, pre and reduced lunch students, um, by race, by gender, which data? You know, which subgroup population are you looking at? Because the all student group doesn't give you the picture. So I wouldn't advocate for giving you an all student picture. Um, because we do have discrepancies in, in results and those in, in those targeted enhancements are in this budget and in previous budgets um, in terms of interventions and supports for our subgroup populations. So if you say, is there a chart with data, I would say, what data? Go ahead, sir. Uh, I just, so going off of that just for one one moment back to your budget lines with reductions i guess one of my concerns and the reason why i'm kind of going down this trail is you've got math assessment being reduced the math program improvement being reduced which you know i understand listen i'm not one to to worry too much about 
uh, decreases, yet when we're talking about math, I guess it's a special concern. Obviously been a lot of headlines, and I just want to make sure that those programs are funded appropriately versus A, what we've done in the past, B, what we're trying to accomplish, and C, you know, again, I understand you don't want to compare necessarily to other towns, but yet we want to be competitive, right, with how we're performing uh, specific to math and science. Can I just say, I don't want this to appear misleading, which uh, when I look at it from the outside with what Mr. Tassani was trying to accomplish with this, this is to show you that he did a zero, uh, a bottom-up budget approach. In the past, we had rolled forward what we had been doing and did an additive approach. Math was invested in last year, therefore we made some adjustments this year. There are cyclical adjustments that happen in the curricular and assessment. The point of this slide is not to say that we reduced our commitment to math, but that we're, we're aware that the commitment was big in math last year, and this year there's a bigger commitment in early literacy, for example. It was to show you that these budget lines were adjusted and not just kept the same and added a percentage. So I didn't want to be, we don't want to be misleading with this, and I just wanted to explain it in that way. Oh. No, thank you. That helps quite a bit. Appreciate that. Go ahead, Jim. Okay, so you'll come back and address this. I mean, I don't care how it's broken out, to sure. be honest with you. I love data. You know, I, I'll take whatever breakdown you want. I'd like, I would like all of it, <laughs> to, me, to be honest with you. I'd like the whole district as one. Uh, if you want to break it out by sex, that, that's, that's fine. Uh, if you I think that helps. I can send you the link to if you think it's site, and you can, you can go, you can spend hours upon hours. I've done it okay. a lot in the last several weeks. Okay. Um, over the weekend, just trying to um, formulate some of some of the areas that we need to target for, for growth and improvement and some of the areas where I think we have um, um, potentially to look at on why we're doing so well and, and how we can replicate that in other places. And yeah, this year's data presentation is available for you also online. Okay, so after the tests are done and you get the data back, I would like that analysis after you've had time to think about it sure. and, and, your, and, your, and your opinion on it. Okay. Yeah, it, it would just be refreshing and this way we could ask questions going forward. Sure, fair Okay, yeah. and if you want to put these da the data up and we can go through it online, put it on a screen if, if that's what you feel better at, or if you just want to provide a general assessment the way you want to present it, I trust that you'll do that the right way. Part of our investment in this budget is uh, what we call a data warehouse. It'll be a platform that will make data much more easily available to the public um, mm -hmm. uh, on our website, so that is, is part of our ask here is, is investing in a what we call data warehouse um, through a platform called Decision Ed. Great. That sounds great. Um, all right. I've been talking for a while, so. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a, uh, I, I have a question, um, and this is a little bit broad, but uh, so we had our uh, sorry, we had our first night of our budget hearings last night, and, and part of what became apparent in the townside budget was, um, you know, just different risks uh, and unknowns that were there. A lot of them were on the uh, revenue side, which is, you know, probably different from what you see. But, you know, we've got uh, rising interest rates. We've got inflation. Uh, we saw in, in various areas of the budget some that were offsetting different, you know, risks and upsides. So... I guess um, what I would ask is, in terms other than the contractual um, costs in the budget, what are the areas that are of concern to you in terms of potential risk? You know, might that be energy, utilities, capital, uh, and how is the maybe the Board of Education thought about that? Uh, in, in terms of how this budget was constructed? All of the above. <laughs> so supply chain issues, certainly renewing contracts that were up at the end of their five-year life cycle concerned about because we're seeing in, um, when we go back out for negotiation coming in at higher prices um, uh, because of supply chain issues. Um, we were concerned about the health insurance costs. We were happy to hear the 7.1%. We are monitoring that in the future. So one of the things we're doing to mitigate that is going out to bid 
um, for insurance this year to see what the market's doing. So um, compensation for staff, future retention, big, uh, that will continue to be a concern. Close monitoring, like us just doing really tight monthly monitoring on all of our assumptions and making sure that what we assumed is what's happening. And if not, then being transparent with the board quickly so that we can make adjustments. We did, this is a little bit of a tighter budget because we did hear the call to make a budget that was appropriate and we, we, we did do that. And in a climate of inflation and supply chain issues, we, we will have to monitor it closely. Um, the bus, you know, we had a certain assumption about fuel that we hope holds true and we had a certain assumption about utilities before the, the town had finished negotiating the next tranche of rates for electricity. So um, those things will all remain concerned and things that we'll have to keep on top of. Well, I would just say in terms of kind of the board's perspective, I, I don't want to speak for the board as a, as a group, but we certainly have been aware through all of our budget discussions and, and in other discussions about, say, inflationary impacts and how uh, contracts may settle out at higher levels going forward uh, against the inflationary backdrop. So th these are things that we have been considering also. Obviously, um, we're paying, paying a lot of attention to enrollment trends um, because it's going to impact our facility usage issues. So I mean, these, these are kind of the, the broad strokes of things that, that the board has been has been thinking about going through. Uh, I would just echo everything that uh, Ms. Laborie said about the, the current year budget. Uh, obviously, we had a lot of the same questions related to, uh, you know, fuel costs and and bus drivers and, and operational issues that may be impacted by, again, the macroeconomic backdrop. Thank you for that. And I guess, uh, is there anything specific? So I'll, I'll just give you some example. One example, we had an interesting discussion about uh, interest income on the town side last night, which is, you know, budgeted fairly conservatively, but I think, um, you know, there was a, a, a desire to do that because there's, you know, there are there are other uh, aspects of the budget where there may be some risk present. Um, have you quantified any of these risks? Have you built in conservatism somewhere? Like, how does that, I'm just trying to get a little bit more specific in terms of uh, the dollars. I, I feel like on the town side, even after one night, we, we sort of, at least I have in my mind, you know, some, some offsetting risks and upsides and, and you know, budgets are all estimates. We understand that, but I think we want to walk away comfortable that we, you know, understand that in, in one direction or another we feel, we feel comfortable uh, with the estimates that are in there. So, you know, you guys don't budget contingency. Um, you know, every, everything's out there. Did you build in specifically within line items um, the potential for increased costs or any risks or, or not? Only where it was appropriate behind the assumptions. So for, it was really detail. So for example, where we knew that something was up for renewal for a specific commodity, um, the plumbing supplies, you know, we knew that we had to increase for 5%. Um, we're being really tight on how we negotiate on each of the contracts, even given that. So I, I don't mean to be long-winded about this, but to say each bucket is a little bit different. I wouldn't say we dumped something in one bucket and we're conservative in one. I would say the overall approach was transparency and identifying risks and then mutually deciding where we would uh, assume about those risks. So that's true for the health insurances. So for example, we built a budget. We knew at the time it could be anywhere between 8 to 10%. Knowing what happened last year, we built the budget for 10% with 12 vacancies. Although year over year, you see that that health insurance budget only goes up 7% because my in the past we were building in more attrition into the budget. So we built in less attrition. We discussed with the board about what our assumption was behind the attrition. They asked questions. We refined. Um, and now we're at 7%. So we're being transparent about what that amount is. Um, on the staffing, same thing. We had a certain attrition assumption. We walked through that all with the board with what we know today so that we were assuming the risk that the superintendent was proposing being transparent about that with the board. So you know our biggest is the benefits and the and the um, insurance and then on the um, on the side with um, 
special education, um, that tuition number is literally driven by the number of kids we know today, the contracts we have for their services, and what we know happens over time and has been happening recently for the kids that truly have the needs to be outplaced, um, even given the in-house programs that we're building. Then we have an assumption about the revenue that may change. Um, re it, it reduced, so when you talk about the year-over-year -year reduction in tuition, um, I mean, increase in tu tuition needs. Um, that's because there's a reduction in revenue. So the state formerly was reimbursing us just depending on how much relative to the other, you know, municipalities the need was because they had a capped amount. So we wouldn't know if our reimbursement would be 72% or 82%, which was a big deal. They flattened that out for us at 70%, although we're happy to have it flat, and we're not happy because it's a big reduction for Fairfield in revenue. So you see that in the number. So just to be, that's a long-winded way to say, um, I don't think we, I wouldn't say that we've built any conservative pieces into a specific element of the budget, um, but I think it's thoughtful in that we had discussions about what the risks were and budgeted at that point. Would you agree? Like uh, looking at the board, yeah. Okay. Thank you for that, um, Mr. Sark. Yeah, um, I was uh, it's just sort of uh, Mr. Walsh's comments about Westport being heavy in administration made me uh, curious, and so I looked and I saw it looks like they have forty-two central and school administrators for about 498 teachers altogether. And we have almost the same number of administrators, 57 for almost twice as many teachers. So that there, there's some truth to that. Um, but what, what I was wondering is, okay, so clearly they're spending a lot more on administrators, which is, is true. Uh, teacher salaries there are probably a little higher. Um, but if I like look at the graph of us being, you know, just below the average, are there any, services that you think we're missing versus the the schools in the higher end of that uh, column chart? I don't think there's any uh. services, but I do think as you add more buildings and campuses, there's going to be obviously more costs. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, some of our facility costs, and we're looking at that as well in the, um, in, in, in our committees, um, we get a lot of usage out of our buildings and we don't really take in a lot of revenue. So. That's something that's being looked at as well, um, because these buildings do get a lot of use uh, year round and, and facilities. So uh, I know Mr. Peterson has taken that up, and uh, some and uh, Mr. Asa and, and his committee, and it's kind of a, a joint effort as well as uh, our policy committee. Okay, um, I mean, all that said, Staples is routinely rated one of the best schools in the country. Uh, and of some of the schools uh, on, on those other wealthier towns are too. Um, I don't put a lot of stake in those ratings. I bet you as educators don't either. Um, but where I was going before I was interrupted earlier um, w with uh, my demographic questions was, if a third of your teachers live in town, only a third of them are taking advantage of the lower cost of living in Fairfield versus Westport. Um, do you, you have 906 teachers in, in the budget this year. Do you have any sense of what the turnover among them will be? And then uh, I'd like to know what total turnover is on an annual basis. And then do you know how many of the teachers that leave uh, go to other school districts in the area? Well, I think there's going to be a, a, a number that we account for um, in terms of retirement. They're going to age out and... Um, this is another good year to retire for teachers because you can immediately get uh, the advantages of the cost of living adjustment. Um, but also, you know, you have some teachers that are 70% leave within the first five years. So we're going to get some of that attrition as well, that people just leave the profession. Um, but I think for the most part, Fairfield has seen a lot of stability in retaining their teachers. I think it's the environment. I think it's the, the, the overall culture of working here in Fairfield. Um, we are looking at ways that we can improve um, or negate the fact that there could be teachers that leave. For example, two weeks ago, um, I met with first year teachers right in this room one morning just to get an idea of how we're doing, how we can better support them. 
So we are cognizant of the fact that it is a uh, very difficult profession right now to retain folks. And we've built a relationship now with Sacred Heart University in terms of a uh, program, um, a cross endorsement program to keep teachers um, and also build a pipeline of teachers. So it, it's a, to your point, it's a very unpredictable number. Um, but I think the history here um, and all the things that we highlighted at the beginning of the presentation uh, really show that uh, people want to work here. Um, I don't think a lot of the folks that live out of town um, live up the line or, or south. I think they just come from a variety of different areas, but they do come here to Fairfield to work um, because of, of the environment it, here, it, it is and, and the successes that we've talked about. Um, the, your qualitative response is helpful. Um, I, and I don't want to sound pushy, but I am a little surprised that you don't have numbers that you can reach uh, to give me a quantitative answer to that question. So maybe you, if you could come I, back I, to if us. If I could predict. Uh, no, I no, could, no, not predict. Just go back over the past three years of history and well, I think tell me the, where the people went. You know, that, that would be useful. Well, I don't know if we always know where they go. You know, they don't necessarily say they're leaving um, and going to Westport or they're leaving and going to Norwalk. Um, it's, it's a great question. Sometimes they say they're leaving for personal reasons and they may end up in another school district. But I think it's hard to look at the last three years. They were very, very unique years um, within the profession. I think we're starting to see a, a leveling off. Um, but I also think it's gonna be more difficult in recruitment um, of younger uh, teachers into the profession because we're competing against so much more in the private sector. And it's also, can I just piggyback off that answer a little bit? Um, it's also really hard, um, much harder in our shortage areas, Mr. Stark. So there are certain subject areas across the state, not just unique to Fairfield, but things like secondary math and science, world language, bilingual education, special education there. And so it kind of depends on um, what teacher, what kind of teacher that you're talking about when you say, when you ask a question like that. So um, if we, if a physics teacher has the pick of the mill, it's going to be harder versus, say, something that there's more common of. So it just depends on the type of teacher as well. OK, thank you, Mr. Stark. And, and I don't know if there's a way to simplify that question, but what is the turnover built into the budget statistic? Yeah, so um, we do have attrition uh, built into the budget. Um, we assumed 19 retirees. Last mm -hmm. year we had 42. We yep. had a lot of discussion at the table about that, um, and, and we feel pretty comfortable with that number. Um, but attrition is a little bit different. So the attrition that we've built in has a certain assumption about time to fill and the vacancy rates. and Right. Um, that, that, um, uh, a little bit different than why, why people leave, which we do have anecdotally, which we can get you know, for you from the HR director. She no, I'm just, I'm just looking for the, the number. Like, I understand the retirements, but I know, you know, like in my own business, we all we knew we had 15% turnover every year. We had a, there was sort of a churn in a hiring pipeline that had to happen. Is that a, a, an assumption in your budget? Yeah, our staff replacement number, which is inclusive of the retirees and general attrition is 1.2 million. So we budgeted 100%, and then uh, we budgeted a, a reduction of 1.2, assuming time to fill and vacancies. How, how many people is that? It, it, well, it, I can't quantify the number of people because it's also time to fill, so it's Got two it. factors, but I could get that back for you. Okay. Um, this year, yeah. So this year, the retirees was 40, and from start to finish, the number of hires that have happened on the certified side, I believe, are about... 30. I don't want to misspeak, but um, so it, it, we could get that for you, though. Yeah, no, and just and not to go down a rabbit hole, but the the 1.2 million is that um, is that a net number reflected in the budget? So that's that's vacancies less a recruiting costs in there or no? They're not. No, okay. this is just literally um, an assumption about uh, retirees, which is the savings of the retirees is the difference between the salary that they yeah. retire at and the new okay. and then time to hire <coughs> in vacancies. So whether I consider it a vacancy if it's open for more than two months, I kind of bump it into that vacancy category versus attrition, normal time to hire, 
now is like zero to two months. It didn't used to be, but it's just taking a little bit longer. Okay, no, thank you. And part of the reason I'm asking is, uh, you know, obviously that retiree attrition number was the, the big driver for the surplus this year. And um, I know you, you reevaluated the methodology that you used to calculate that, and the assumed retirements have come way down. But I was um, also curious about the, uh, the other churn and what effect that has had on the current year budget and how that translated into assumptions going forward for next year in this budget. Yeah, and so... Um, Non-retirement, just to be clear. The yeah. regular attrition. So we matched and, and then um, ap approximately what was happening this year and adjusted for the paraeducators um, in the belief that given the higher level or the better level of compensation that we would be able to retain the paraeducators at a better rate. Okay. Thank you. I think Thank it's you. also worth noting that as we move forward, when someone retires at $110,000, the likelihood of replacing them with a $52,000 employee is probably not going to happen as much as it used to in years past. You're probably going to fill that with a more experienced, seasoned veteran, if, if you can, knowing that once you get that person, they're more likely to finish their and career. Can you just un unpack that? What, why is that? Well, just there, not a lot, less new teachers entering. A lot, okay, a lot less new teachers. Okay, and if you can plug in someone that uh, from another district who's been well trained, um, and still see some savings, but have somebody more experienced um, that you know is not going to leave you again, um, it's it's more advantageous right now. Okay. And just to add to your previous question about the risk in the budget, I think this is the most chal was the most chal challenging piece because the last three years have been so anomalous and the future's a little bit uncertain in the, in the profession as well. So, you know, the assumptions we've made, we're gonna continue to monitor, but um, it, it was hard to predict the last two years um, in the profession in terms of what would happen. We're hopeful it's coming to a place of more normalcy next year. Okay, thank you. Mr. Walsh. Yes, to follow up, uh, Ms. Charlton, on your uh, questions, I want to talk specifically about the retirements. And, and instead of me asking you like 10 questions, can you just kind of summarize where we, I know you said the number 40, where that ranks in previ to previous years, because that sounds like a dramatically higher budgeted number, which I, I think is a, a good thing seeing where the trend was. And, but can you just talk to that whole area and how you decided to come to 40 and you know what that's what that means sure so we've we've averaged if you go back to about 2016 about 20 you know certified retirees per year it goes up and down it depends on where we are in salary negotiations so you know if they've seen a big bump in their recent negotiation that incentivizes people sometimes to take advantage of that time frame. Sometimes when there's a new superintendent, you know, we saw in 2016, we saw a lot of retirements because there had been someone with us for a long, long time at, up until 2016 or 17. Um, and so, so some of those factors happen, but about 20 or so. It's a regression analysis that looks back over 15 years and adjusts every year for uh, what happens differentiating between male and female um, with that regression analysis being applied to the current population. So because we have less people in our population that are of those ages, uh, applying that regression analysis and then being conservative about, not conservative, being slightly more aggressive knowing that we were conservative in the past, um, led, led us to 19 people total that we're projecting. And when we look at where we are this year compares, compared to where we were last year and the year before, in terms of people notifying us by this time of the year, we're, we're about on trend to hopefully achieve this amount, not an amount in excess of that for next year, so. So the amount you're planning on is 40 retirements? No, oh, I'm sorry, 40 I'm sorry. was this year. Uh, next okay. year we're planning on 19. So you think that's a dramatic number, a d dramatic difference in yes. the number, correct? Correct. Okay. So there's not really a lot of risk in that for you though, right? Because if, if it's more, it's actually savings for you. So there's really not risk in the budget for that, correct? It's only a risk, I guess, if you get less than that, right? Yeah, well, just the risk of being off. No, if you're asking for the risk of not being covered, I'm talking about I the financial risk? Yeah, I mean, given what Mr. Tosani said about, you know, the, this is also applying a per person number that was also based on history. So 
per person. I think it's like $35,000 savings, and we'll probably see less than that on a per person basis this year, given what's happening in the market and the climate. We also looked at the age of the current teaching staff. So um, anyone under 55 years of age is not likely to retire because yes. of the hit they would take uh, financially uh, with the teacher retirement board. Mm -hmm. um, so anyone under that age, you have to factor in is going to stay. Sure. Um, early retirement age is until 55. Mm -hmm. And based on the number of years someone would have at 55, it may not be advantageous to leave at that point either. Um, because they, especially with the cost of living right now, it, it would be very difficult for some folks to, um, if, unless they're at 30 years, at least 30 years, it wouldn't be to their advantage to leave the yeah. profession. With the um, higher than normal amounts of retirements that you've been seeing, I presume that you get to a certain point where they're not at the age, they're, right? They're so you're running out of people right. to almost retire at right. that those ages. Yeah, because kind you, of what you're saying. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Because when you apply that now, regression number to a lower number, you're coming up with a lower number. That's There's what, just less people yes. at that age left. Yes. That's okay. what's caused the crisis across the state and across the country is that there was a lot of folks that all at once decided to go. We had, I mean, for years you had, it had been predicted that in the next ten years you're going to see this much retirement. But because things were good, people stayed longer. They were enjoying themselves, and then COVID hit, and then they're not enjoying themselves. <laughs> not anymore. No. Not enough. It's a harder job. Well, and and yeah. when you start looking at as the progression of deductions has increased to stay, you're working for pennies on a dollar. And yeah. It's not to your advantage to stay any longer unless you really love what you're doing, and the money is not why you're doing it. Understood. Okay. Just wanted to finish up that conversation, which we do every year. So, thank you. And thank yeah, you and yeah, that. just to clarify, because you're right. I mean, I think when I say risk, we think downside risk. But for me, what I was trying to more focus on is where do we have significant estimates in the budget that can change? Because obviously, yeah, those I, I, can go I, in either direction. Yeah, you and yeah. I are always talking about financial risk. <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I think we're always on this on, on that. Yeah, and I, I yes, and but but. Um, I was you know, significant estimates are always the thing are always the thing, right? And that was, you know, the, the the big estimate that was off in last year was obviously this retirement estimate, and we all understand that, and it's been adjusted and everything. But that's why I'm trying to kind of understand what those pieces are. Um, yeah, and and it's interesting because you know, you guys, that 1.2 million. What did you call that? Like time to fill, or however you yeah, we call it? it staff replacement. That's what they've said over staff. time, and that's and that's a credit, right? Because you don't have that, and and yeah, it's it, it's a difference in how it's handled on the town side, which is, assumes 100 percent. You know, there's no vacancies built into the budget per se. Yeah, so it's a, it's a little bit different. So that's a, um, it's uh, you know. Yeah, I used to apply attrition percentage, and mm -hmm. you know we would just test that over time in my old world in New York City, and that worked. Here, it doesn't work as well. So, so we have these lines for the retirement, and then we have a line for time to hire. And like I said, I, I then create a separate category of vacancy because something's going to be vacant if it's more than two months. It's hard to fill. I want to yeah. account for that differently than the time to fill. Okay. So I can break that out more finely if you'd like for future because we'll be watching it closely next year. So. Okay. Thank you. Um, and um, Jim? Mr. Testine, I did like what you said. I mean, that, which is, uh, I think, a benefit to the district. I mean, I'm not an educator, and you obviously know, you, and everybody up here knows um, a lot more about education than I'll ever know. Um, but that we are hiring some people with experience um, because I think that's a value to the students if you can find the right person and they have experience as opposed to just always looking to hire someone right out of school. Um, that if some, we can get somebody who, who, who's willing to move over, we get a better teacher. Absolutely. So, um, so I, would, I, I totally understand that and I would expect you to be doing that, so thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. Mr. Curley, you had a question? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm actually gonna take this in a slightly different direction, and I know Mr. Papa George is not here, but I have more of a facilities type question. Um, we were talking a little bit about uh, risks earlier, and um, electricity and fuel was one of the comments. Um, I, I note on page pages 181 and 182 on, in your book, you talk about the, uh, the uh, uh, PV solar arrays that are installed and, and on the second page you talk about the electricity and the fuel 
uh, the heat. Um, so a couple of questions. One, um, kudos, uh, 13 installations on your uh, various facilities, and I know that this, the actual realized savings uh, in the last year updated was almost $300,000. That's a natural hedge against rising um, electricity rates, obviously, because you've got these long-term power purchase agreements. Um, noting that the uh, place and service uh, dates for these systems started in 2016 and, and the last installation was 2020, um, do you know off the top of your head how long those PPAs were? Are they 20-year, 25-year agreements? I don't, I don't know. I know in my old world that there were 20 year agreements, but um, I'm not sure what we have here in Fairfield, but I can, I could get that for you, certainly. I think these were standard agreements that I, I do, I do believe they were, I don't, I, 20 or 25 at least, yeah. It, and that's fine. It, follow up is fine. That's, that's great. It, I, I think it's something to be proud of and, and something to recognize, so it, it's not something to, to hide. Um, and on that note, uh, page 181, it looks like the data is a little stale. So I was just uh, uh, wondering if we could get uh, the uh, fiscal years 2021 and 2022 and then the subsequent year uh, populated uh, because obviously that, that data should be available and, and, and rightly we, you can be recognizing or, or at least um, uh, uh, noting the savings that you're recognizing. So We will do that. There was just a challenge with the um, methodology for the base number um, that we're rectifying. So we should have that before we wrap up the budget at the tail end. Um, yeah, but that's been an ongoing problem with the, w working that out with the town. Okay, and then one last thing uh, to note, and I'm hoping this is not a risk and it's truly just a typo, um, but on page 182, it looks like your rate for electricity is noted at 18 cents per kilowatt hour and it should be 21. Uh, far right column, 2023-2024, total electricity rate, um, 7.3 cents plus 13.7 is noted at 18, uh, but I think that adds to 21. Thank you. That's an error. Uh, we will make a correction. <laughs> You're the first person to point that out. Thank you. Mr. Curl is our watchdog. He always catches. Yeah, the, he, he always he catches always, the. He always catches the. If there's errors. a footing error in the book, Craig's yeah. on it. Yeah, he's so. He's, he's, he's he's on on it. for too much savings there. I, I know I don't that. have to do the math because Craig's already done. <laughs> so, um, Ms. Laborious, we've we've had, uh, and I hope I trust that you've been keeping track because I actually have not been. Um, but I just want to ask that for all of these follow-up questions, um, maybe you can coordinate with Frank because we'd like to get him. Onto our, um, onto our combined document uh, that we have. And so what, what he's done, he or I have been just quickly transcribing the questions and then putting the attachments in there. So, um, you know, for example, for this item, you know, if you could just quantify whatever it is and, and for the other follow-ups, whether they're links to data or whatever, that'd be helpful. So. Have him share that document so I could just type it if he doesn't mind and just make those links. Thank you so much. All right. Can I any follow other? up Mr. Curley's question in regards to the photovoltaic systems? Yes. Especially <laughs> the ones at the high school, um, and, and maybe you can talk about other ones. But in general, um, I know at the high schools that you can charge your cars at, at some of these locations, correct? I did not know that. Parking. Yeah, parking. So like at Ward. We'll like charge it for parking. I thought you meant. Yeah, yeah, no, the electric. No, I'm done talking about the, can you charge? Can somebody, a student or a teacher, can can they charge their cars at any of our schools? No, I don't. We don't have those installed. Okay, I think at one point that was um, Mr. Bowman was going to allow for that, and the question became, well, that's going to reduce how much money right. we we have as savings, and then how do you control when we ask? We're asking Mr. Bowman about this. Uh, was how are you going to control the public? <laughs> then from not being there the whole time right. and what was going to be the process if someone parks their car there but doesn't move it you know what i mean so so there's no charging stations, stations no. at any of our school locations no it all the photovoltaic goes to the school great end of that question thank you thank you any other questions from the board Ms. LeClaire, anything? Okay, all right. Well, we, thank you. 
What's that? You're talking about total questions overall and just this matter. No, I'm talking about total questions overall. We do okay. have the two other small departments to get to once we're right. done with the book. But if right. you have more questions on this budget, go ahead. Uh, I just had some questions as we were going through the pro as we were going through the uh, the process. Number one, I, I want to give kudos on this presentation because I liked the way you identified whether it was a plus or minus to the budget and what the percentage was, not only dollar-wise, because it's very helpful to identify really why this budget kind of went up or down mm -hmm. without having to spend all the time doing calculations. So I would, um, I don't know how everybody else feels about it, but I, I would encourage that that continue. Um, it's, it, I think it was one of the major ads for me in your presentation. Um, not to insult anybody, but they've become a little stale over the years. Gotcha. <laughs> so I will say that um, as we were going through it, it was, and it will help me going forward, continuing to read some of the information that's here. Uh, this was especially uh, redone after the board approved it to uh, present to town body. So you get the, you guys get the better version. <laughs> <laughs> So I don't know whose idea that was, but it was well, a very good idea. I, I, so whoever desire, deserves that kudos, congratulations. Thank you. It, I appreciate was, that. That was, that was, that was great. Um, okay. So com the population numbers, uh, you have the numbers going up, correct, for the next year? Are they going up for the entire district? No, no. It goes... Uh, it you mean the student population? Yeah. Do we do we have do we have is there? A, I couldn't seem to find it in the book. On on page one forty four, you'll see that there our projection for twenty three twenty four is a slight dip to ninety two seventy nine students from the uh, current and I believe this is October one, okay. uh, twenty twenty two number of ninety three oh nine. Okay. Do we have a projection going forward? Your latest projection. And can you provide that? The perspective is that here in the. That's um, on the page before. Uh, the page before, yeah. But is there? So it's a little confusing. I, I'm not seeing the, the total three. number. I, I guess know. I guess I could take the bottom right uh, pay, the the right column, but then add them all together. Yeah, I think you have it in your PowerPoint because I did do that for you okay. um, because I found that confusing as well. Yeah. Uh huh. You're correct. Yeah. Okay. And once again, does this add up the total numbers, or is this? Oh, just I didn't break give you the out? total. Yeah. If you add up those three, it adds up to a total. Okay. Could you provide yeah. us with just the total numbers sure. in a somehow at the top yeah. of this or something? Just put the total yes. numbers. And so they're going to be going forward. They're going to be slightly, approximately a downward trend of a little bit. Um, correct until maybe the last year, 2930. Yeah, I think you have to look, I mean, at the levels too, but yeah, overall, total overall. population, a slight dip. A, yep. slight, a slight dip. Uh-huh. Okay. Excuse me? We had 10-year um, enrollment projections provided in June of 2022, and then we get, in, for in, in terms of budgeting, we get a one-year update also from the consultant. Um, so there was a variance between the June and the update for this budget book. The elementary projection went up um, by net of like like 70, 80 students actually on the upside and a little in the five, six on middle school, high school down. So if you remember from previous... Um, presentations that you've all received from consultants in the past that there was the trough, you know, the down on the elementary, the secondary was high, then elementary was going to start to go back and the secondary was start to go down. So we're beginning to see the beginnings of those waves. So um, elementary, as pre predicted, um, is going to start to increase a little bit. And we saw that just a change between November and, um, I mean, June and when we got this update um, shortly thereafter. So an increase of elementary students and a couple middle and high school lower or something. So, so when you get the updated numbers, when they go through the, the district demographic study, you'll likely see it go up in the out years total because I did do that comparison, but I didn't include it because everything else was based on those June numbers in the budget. Okay. But you'll see an update. It did change. Yeah. Okay. 
are the numbers that you most recently got for the budget, are those the numbers you're going to be using to make your decisions for October, or are you going to have to do a whole new series of numbers for that? Yeah, we are, we're, then we are paying for an update of the, of the numbers that uh, were 2022 numbers that we, that we have, that we've seen most recently. Yes, yeah. so the implementation year for redistricting is 2024, 2025. So ideally, they would be actually using that year forward, not now, right? Okay. So sure. it will be obviously an estimate and, and a projection um, of that time. But yes, it, it will be rooted in 24, 25 forward for all middle, elementary, middle, and high school as well. This, uh, what we paid for here, was a 10-year light, knowing that this redistrict, the demographic study was coming to be able to do make those decisions. So because of that, you would expect some variations because it was like a light. A no, light. I, I understand. Yeah. You didn't want to pay for a full-blown one, and you knew you were about to order another one, so you just did a quick update for the budget. Okay. Uh, no other questions, Madam Chairwoman? Thank you. Um, any other questions? before we move to the uh, other two? Okay, thank you. Um, okay, we're gonna just flip to, if everybody has their regular budget book, um, and I'm gonna, um, somebody, somebody help me out here. <laughs> Jim, maybe you remember, Sheila, I'm drawing a little bit of a blank. Before you guys go, we have, the, we have public school transportation and um, we also have health and welfare services, which is on page 223 of the regular budget book. And for some reason, I'm drawing a blank on this one. Um, Courtney, is this? This is us. Okay. This yeah, I, us. I just, for, for whatever reason, I'm, I'm just, it's, it's, a small, it's a small budget, uh, very, very small change uh, year to year. But do you, you, yeah, can you this speak is to that? Thank uh, you. The amount of money that um, the town provides to the Board of Education to support staff on our non-public team. We're required under federal law to locate and identify students with potential disabilities and to evaluate them at all of our, um, you know, parochial or private schools within the town of Fairfield. Um, so that's what that, that figure represents. Okay, and it's pretty flat, so I'm assuming, uh, and it looks like we don't have many changes in the, it, it's all. Yeah, so yeah there's okay. very little change there. Okay. This is page uh, 223, Health and Welfare Services. Health and Welfare Services, right. Yeah, it's $145,000 budget. Only changed from $1,000 since last year. All right, any questions on that? Okay. All right, so let's, uh, last one, and we're done. Page 99 in the regular budget book, which is private school bus transportation. You know, I, I feel like we used to have a uh, calculation in the budget book, and now we have a link here. Um, but this budget is, oh, the, and the link doesn't work. All right. So this is, uh, again, on page 99. And it's the last line item, 2531, private school bus transportation. And it's a budget of uh, 1287693 versus, which is a 9% increase for about $100,000 since last year. So I know we don't have a, uh, a backup sheet in the book. Courtney, can you kind of walk us through this? I'm just opening up my backup now. Um, okay. Did you say page 99? Yeah, page 99, it, it's the last line item. Yeah, okay, yeah. got it. Yep. Yep. <laughs> okay, so similar to the Board of Ed, um, the non-public transportation has tiered buses. So tier one, two, and three, cleaning. Then they pay, we pay for a late bus, uh, Notre, Notre Dame bus, and Fair, Fairfield Country Day. Um, the difference in uh, the increase is associated with an increase in the number of runs, it looks like. So the current year we're doing, I apologize, I'm just adding it up. 20. Current year, we're doing 20 runs. Next year, we're going to need 23 based on um, feedback from late misses at some of the um, non-public schools. So to make the runs work, we need to have 23. So that majority of the difference is goes from, let's see if I have uh, that.
That's about 125,000 of the difference, um, the rest being fuel. So um, we also charge an administrative overhead piece. Um, that's a small percentage of the staff that works on it. Um, salary, I think it's like 5%. Um, we negotiated that with Frank to charge a little bit less uh, this year because we didn't think that it was worth 5%, so I think we gave him a, a discount on that piece. But the bulk of it is due to fuel costs, and then that's based on the town's fuel rate with an assumption based on the number of buses and that increase in the number of runs, which I think was one extra bus for the additional runs. Okay, thank you. Any questions from the board? Mr. Walsh? Yeah, you, I thought you said 21 to 23. Is it only one increase in runs? 20 to 21? 20 to 23, I'm sorry, three more runs. Three more runs, Yes, okay. three more runs, one bus, right? Okay. Questions on this? No. All right. Uh, any, uh, is anyone from the public um, on uh, wanting to comment on the WebEx? All right. I'm sorry. I have the exact number. So 104 is due to the increase in bus. $337 is due to the increase in um, late buses. $7,000 due to the increase in fuel, which is a 7% increase. We had an adjustment to the prepayment bond, which we gave you more credit for, and then kept flat on the park and rec rate. So that's 111 increase. So um, yeah. OK, great. Yeah, we, we should get that. Uh, we'll get that attachment. Uh, to our materials, but I think we are done. Thank you, um, I, I, everyone. I, I do want to, um, you know, repeat everyone's comments. It was a terrific presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks to everyone who um, helped put the budget together, and for all that you do for our students, for the town. Thank you. All right, I'll take a motion to adjourn. Thank you. Mr. Matola, Mr. Don't put your hands up so quick. Mr. Curley, all in favor? <laughs> all right. Aye. Good night, everyone. <laughs>